So as Stephen said, uh, I'm ex Rolls Royce now with ATS uh, Global. Um, ATS uh, are not a brand that many people recognise, um, but ATS have been supporting Rolls Royce in the digitalisation and manufacturing journey for the last 14 or so years. So um, I speak with almost a foot, well, with a foot in both camps, really, as a, as a customer and supplier now. Uh, so I can give you that kind of insight. And, and as Stephen says, it's really important to talk about uh, implementation of Industry 4.0 in events like this. Um, you know, it was it was highly inspiring to listen to our speakers yesterday about creating the right environment to uh, to encourage Industry 4.0. But actually, uh, as manufacturers, you need courage. You need um, reference cases. You need learning from people that have gone on before. And, and hopefully, um, that's what you'll find um, within this presentation. Um, as we touched on yesterday, um, that uh, this is the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and we heard from uh, Lord Pryor quite eloquently yesterday what the previous three industrial revolutions were. And uh, it, you know, he put it in, uh, in football parlance, you know, we won the first one, the second one was a score draw, and the third one was definitely won by the US. And uh, the, the theme yesterday was how do we position ourselves to win the fourth? Um, but what is the fourth industrial revolution? I was at a, um, a working group um, at the National Composite Centre, one of the other high value manufacturing uh, catapults here in the UK, uh, located in Bristol. And uh, I was in a room, uh, there was about 10 of us, um, all uh, kind of industry uh, professionals, um, all, all suppliers of components of industry uh, 4.0. And um, we thought we'd better define what Industry 4 was if we were going to uh, uh, create some kind of demonstrator at the Composite Centre. And um, there were 10 people in the room. You can guess how many different definitions we generated of what Industry 4.0 was, and the answer is, of course, at least 10. Uh, there were probably more, actually, because some people had, had several goes. Um, so, you know, I'll give you what I think, you know, how I look at Industry 4.0, and I look at it really as a series of eight capabilities <coughs> which, uh, which need to be developed and implemented. <laughs> So starting at the top, connectivity, connection. Um, so that's development of uh, infrastructure or deployment of infrastructure, actually getting IT kit or Internet of Things kit connected, getting sensors on machines connected. And it sounds trivial, but if you've done it, you know that it's a non-trivial task. Um, so that's the absolute basic first thing that we need to do. Then once we're connected, we actually need to acquire some data, and um, preferably then give that data some context, context some contextualization. That data on its own is interesting, but actually um, it isn't particularly informative. So uh, we need to bring it together with other pieces of data, and so that requires a capability of aggregation of data. Still all well and good. I've brought all this data together somehow, but uh, I now need to kind of interrogate it or understand what it's telling me. Uh, so I need some kind of visualization capability, and visualization there can mean anything from, you know, reports, graphs, and you know, if you like, all the traditional 2D uh, media. Or it can be visualizing something in a, in a virtual reality type of world. So multiple kind of types of visualization. Going beyond visualization then, I want to start to, to predict what might happen next. So everything um, previous to that has been, if you like, looking in the rear view mirror about what has happened but I want to use what has happened somehow 
to guide what might happen next and what I might do about it. So you need some kind of prediction capability. Prescription then is the action that I might want to take based upon, the inf based upon what I think is going to happen next. And then the, the final capability is, is cognition. Um, I, uh, there are colleagues from, from IBM uh, here, certainly were here yesterday, um, who have uh, uh, some, some vested interest in, uh, in, in cognitive uh, capabilities, as you'll see in a second. Um, and, and really, that's how, about how we might apply artificial intelligence into uh, deciding or learning from all of this data and deciding the best way to react to it instead of a human decision-making process, so an adaptive learning uh, system. And of course, as you uh, go down this column of capabilities, you get increasing value. So at the top, you know, it's interesting to have gathered some data, but down the bottom you actually get into how do I step into a manufacturing process and really implement some control to, to ensure that I get the highest possible uh, yield or the, the fastest possible flow or whatever the uh, application is. But, of course, defining Industry 4.0 just purely in terms of the eight capabilities really misses out on the... the um, the, the, the technologies that are all coming together uh, to, to help with this uh, journey. Um, so everything from IoT uh, devices, IoT sensors, manufacturing service bus, uh, cloud technologies, uh, data analytics software, uh, virtual and augmented reality capabilities, uh, and, that, and that picture down in the, the bottom right there is, is IBM's uh, Watson uh, that, uh, that that picture there is uh, 2011, where Watson um, beat the, the two uh, reigning um, Jeopardy champions in the game show, the US game show Jeopardy. Um, just to try and create some image of what artificial intelligence might actually look like. So, back in time, 2004, 2005, and I can see eyes glazing over already because it's, an, you know, it's a network diagram, it's got some servers, it's got a PC on it and you know, it looks a bit technical. So I'm not going to talk at all about the, the technicalities of this. But if you can imagine in Rolls-Royce a, a shop floor that had pockets of excellence, so uh, where we had uh, taken uh, machine tool deliveries as a, as a turnkey solution that may have had some uh, computing capability, information technology applied into an operational technology role, um, and as a little island, as a little cell of capability operating um, really, really well. But vast swathes of capability that, that, that was not connected, that didn't have uh, information technology uh, in, in place, had no uh, data acquisition. There were big black holes of, of, of process, really, that, that weren't particularly well understood. Um, that, that's not to say that the product wasn't uh, well understood. The product was, in case you're worried about flying home tonight. But uh, yeah, the, 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 a lot of the processes had been refined over the years as, as, a, as a black art, almost, with, with little visibility of data. And uh, the, the reason for that is because there was no global standardization in place. The, you know, people had decided uh, over the course of time to, to buy whatever they wished, and you had uh, different control systems, different machining centers, different versions of software. We had control systems written in DOS, Windows 95, Windows NT4, uh, you name it. You know, the, the platform was out there. So. Can you imagine the world where you have to try and connect all of this stuff uh, together into your enterprise somehow? And you know, we're talking about 2004, 2005, before groups like this existed, before conferences like this existed, and uh, you know, trying to sell the the vision of connectivity at that point was was pretty difficult, and overcoming the cultural challenge of people making their own decisions about 
how this stuff should be bought and, and connected was, was particularly uh, challenging. But we implemented a, a segregated network and it, it was segregated uh, for a number of reasons. Um, we, we decided that we needed to guarantee the resilience of data flows to and from machines. So if we're going to build, really build IT into the process of manufacturing, we absolutely needed to guarantee that it was going to perform with the highest levels of availability for the technologies available at the time. And that's why we decided on this segregated network. Of course, some industries, that, that's entirely appropriate and, and that would be the solution today. So the nuclear industries, confidential atomic industries, would particularly uh, still operate this, this kind of network today. So it's still valid now, but of course it, it is very limiting. It's very limiting because you have to do kind of machine by machine connections, separate individual bits of software. You have to go through a, a whole standardization process of the commodity of IT uh, to do the connectivity. You need to put in place a service desk that's responsive to those kinds of incidents and really understands uh, manufacturing. Uh, you have to put in a supply chain. You have to look at the ergonomics of every workstation. So, it, it, it's a it's a complex uh, it's a complex business. Just achieving a relatively limited amount of capability. And if um, you know, well, Jürgen's uh, introduction this morning actually was was spot on. If you think of this as being a journey, and that you don't hit perfection right first time. You know, you, you learn from these processes uh, or the, these implementations uh, and, and you learn what works and what doesn't work and therefore there are some successive learnings uh, that came along. And in particular, uh, our learning was that this is incredibly costly to, to do. It gained us a certain amount of data, sure, so it gained us some benefit, but actually it wasn't a really sustainable uh, long-term solution. Uh, and we needed to, to go into a second uh, generation of, of connectivity. So, uh, in this scenario, we had uh, a, the, the business challenge was that we were going to build uh, some new factories in Singapore. We we're going to make uh, fan blades in Singapore, so one of the most complicated components uh, of the gas turbine was going to be made out in Singapore and we were going to assemble civil large engines for the first time somewhere other than Derby. And um, the, uh, the, the challenge was how do we get our business systems that have been traditionally in the UK out into Singapore. So we needed to rewrite a whole load of process control for fan blade uh, manufacture. And, um, and we therefore took the advantage of putting in a new type of, of connectivity um, which involved us um, uh, getting the OEM suppliers of all of our machine tools that were in the fan blade manufacturing process to write bits of code to expose data to us uh, that we could subsequently integrate. And you can imagine that, you know, this is sort of 2009 kind of time, capability within the OEMs to do that was, was quite limited. Um, many of the suppliers that we were talking to were really niche uh, businesses, really highly specialised to the processes, the manufacturing processes that we were, we were operating in fan blade manufacture. So they may not have the in-house capability to write their own control uh, code. So it, it, it wasn't going to be a particularly sustainable solution. It worked for getting us through fan blade manufacture, but it, it, it wasn't something that we were going to be able to roll out on a, on a large scale. So the third go was, was when we opened our new uh, uh, disc manufacturing facility in uh, Washington, near Sunderland in the UK, and our new advanced blade casting facility in Rotherham in the UK, where we created a, a connectivity, a method of connectivity, which was OEM independence. So we got around all of the problems of getting OEMs to write code, uh, not a problem there, but it was still quite labor, it was still quite a labor intensive process to achieve connectivity. 
Um, and for the first time, we were building the manufacturing execution, so the logic of the manufacturing execution system directly into the control of machine tools. And the way we did that in particular caused uh, quite a lot of latency in, in, the, uh, in the communications between uh, the machine tool and, and the MES and back for a decision. Uh, so again, something that was, uh, you know, it was good, it works, it definitely gives us some, uh, starts to give us some, some prescription type capability. The MES was in fact prescribing the actions that the cell should take. But uh, again, um, in many ways limited. So another generation is, is required. So if you think about this in, in the terms of the, the uh, capabilities of Industry 4, I've kind of mapped onto that what our, our generations of uh, progressive learning um, gave us. But of course, they just still didn't give us absolutely everything. And, and, and Industry 4 really requires us to not think about things in uh, you know, the, the client-server configurations anymore. It's more about part-to-part -part communication, machine-to-machine -machine communication, part-to-machine communication, integrating enterprise and uh, IT systems with operational technologies, with IoT. It, it, it's got to have a robustness for business continuity uh, reasons. So, um, uh, you know, it, it, that's there. And uh, it's got to be able to communicate with, with uh, real uh, non-standardization. So as Jürgen said earlier on, if we wait for standardization to happen, we'll never implement anything. So uh, you know, non-standardization is a reality that, that uh, we have to cope with. And so the, the final generation really, which is, uh, which is a manufacturing service bus delivered approach, which is very, very similar in, in many respects actually to what Lars just presented in the sense that there are uh, uh, connectivity uh, pieces, which we call a, a bus stop, um, which are the, the little interface that we've developed to the specific control protocol or to the specific controller uh, or the IoT sensor or whatever it may be. And or to an enterprise IT system, such as a manufacturing execution or an ERP system, and a publish and subscribe type model where you would uh, you, you would say, well, I'm as an MES, I'm interested in this piece of data here, and whenever that piece of data pops up from its originating source, the MES would be given it, and that would there's a level of persistence built into that. So um, there are two case studies which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, One's here. Once at the Centre for Aerospace Manufacturing in Nottingham University. Uh, I've run out of time, but if uh, during the break you want to uh, talk about any of the case studies of where we've implemented this, then uh, uh, I'll be here. Thank you. <laughs>